Well, good afternoon. I think we're going to go ahead and start. We had some technical difficulties about video streaming live, but we're going to go ahead and get started because I want to respect your time this afternoon because you were very kind to come here and obviously want to hear information. Okay. Better? <laughs> I'm Pat O'Bannon, and this is the Tuckahoe Town meeting for Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. And it is about uh, keeping you informed about what to do in an emergency and about the coronavirus. Now, I know you've been hearing a lot about that in the news, on TV. You probably know more about what's happened in China in the last month than you do about here. And you may have heard bits and pieces of answers, and you've seen maybe a few questions asked of a public health official. Uh, on today's news, I was watching this morning, and things have been changing rapidly. There have been um, public health officials on TV, on the different stations, cable and regular TV. So this is your chance. You know what's going on in the world. You know what's going on in the U.S. maybe even, or in Virginia. But what would happen in your own neighborhood, and how could you, what could you do? How would you handle it? And what are some tips? And what, what is the information that you need? So I also want to, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and thank those that are here that might be viewing online. I know we're not sure they're here, but those of you here, pass it on that this is, the town meetings are also presented live online through YouTube. And with that, um, you go online, you sign up through your search engine, whether it be Google, DuckDuckGo, Microsoft Edge, whatever you use to, to get to websites. And then you put in there YouTube and, of course, Henrico County, Virginia government, because there isn't, uh, by the way, there are other Henrico counties and there is another Tuckahoe village in the United States. Several areas are, are called Tuckahoe. And go to YouTube, search for Henrico County, Virginia government and Tuckahoe town meeting. And usually the screen will be close and it will have a picture of something like uh, Twin Lakes, Recreation Center or the Government Administration Building or the library and you can wait a few minutes and get online. Are we set up yet? Okay. <laughs> on the screen you would see on the right side of the screen you can sign when, if you sign in with Google and the way you would sign in on your with using your Google uh, access and Google sign in you can ask your questions right there on the screen. Uh, as, as you also see up here, if you sign in on any of the other search engines, you can get us today with my email address. I've got my iPhone right here. <laughs> P-O-B at patobannon.com. And in using that, you can ask your questions, and as we come in, uh, we'll have them answered by the experts that we have here today, because we have some really good folks here today to talk to you. Um, also, I want to encourage you to download, if you have an iPhone, to download the county's app. Uh, it's free, and you go to the app store, and you can use it on an iPhone or an Android, and it could be where you could get emergency information very quickly. Uh, it's, it's a quick way also to get you to the website, the county's website. So I would encourage you to go to the county's website if you're on your, your home computer, or if you have an iPhone or, or, or a another type phone, uh, down, you have the app, you can easily get information. We're also going to talk about something called Code Red. I would also encourage you to download Code Red uh, to your phone, particularly if you have this kind of phone. You can't live without these anymore, I think. So please, and you'll hear about things like that that would help you um, to understand an emergency, to get information for your area specifically, maybe even down to your neighborhood. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now I'm going to introduce the folks that are here. Um, to the furthest left is Emily Ashley, and she's the emergency manager for Henrico County. Uh, she recently joined, oh, I'm going to use her. Yes, I have a good bio for her. She's the emergency management coordinator for Henrico County. And as an emergency manager in Central Virginia and Hampton Roads, she has served on the Virginia Emergency Management Association Executive Committee and is former chair of the Central Virginia Emergency Management Alliance. She co-authored the textbook, 
the developing role of public libraries in emergency management. Emily has especially enjoyed emergency management projects related to inclusive planning, mitigation, con continuity planning, and exercise development. She holds a bachelor's degree in geography from Missouri State University, a master's degree in public administration from Old Dominion University, and a graduate, and she is a graduate of Leadership Metro Richmond and has professional certification as a Virginia professional emergency manager. And she is on the end. Uh, next we have Melissa Varey, she's a physician, and she is the deputy director of the Henrico District Health Department. Dr. Varey is the deputy uh, director of, of, and health services where she oversees communicable disease epidemiology. That's what we're talking about today. Uh, she is in a, knows emergency preparedness and response. Uh, she understands opiate response activities and has medical oversight of Richmond City's clinics. Dr. Varey came to us from the Hawaii Department of Health. I don't know why you'd want to leave Hawaii. <laughs> where she served as the deputy state epidemiologist for the state of Hawaii. She's a former epidemic intelligence service officer with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You've probably heard a lot about them lately. She also worked as a doctoral epidemiologist with the CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. So that's Dr. Varey. And the last, certainly not least, we have Sarah Morris, she is their Henrico Advocate for the Aging. Sarah serves as the Advocate for Aging in Henrico County. She received a bachelor's degree in health sciences from James Madison University. She has a master's degree in gerontology from Virginia Commonwealth University. Previously, she worked for Senior Connections, the Capital Area Agency on Aging. And as an Advocate for the Aging, her role focuses on care coordination, social events, educational seminars, such as this one, and outreach. She has some interesting information that I think a lot of you will want to know about, too. Now, uh, first I'm going to start off by, we have some questions here, but I wanted to ask the, folk, the ladies who are up here if they want to talk about, let's start with Dr. Ray, and what you think are the questions, the most pressing questions that folks here would be interested in. And I've got some that people have called me about or have emailed me about already. And I think she knows some of these, so you might touch on them. But let's tell us what's going on generally in the United States, what it means to have an emergency, you know, state of emergency, but also what's in Virginia and what you might anticipate in our community. What actually, can you, can you all hear me? All right. I might stand up and walk around a bit. I, um... Uh, I get antsy. I might actually start with my, if we have my slide set ready, because that might answer a lot of the questions that y'all might have. And I will, I get antsy, I'm sorry. I might walk around if y'all can hear me. Would you mind lighting up my? Okay. Uh oh. Nope, that's not right. I can roll without it. <laughs> Some other slide issues. Um, my name is Melissa Bure. I come from the public health world, and part of what I'm here to do today is talk to you all a little bit about what is everybody getting all worried about? Why are we all worried about this novel coronavirus we're hearing out of China? So what we let, and kind of, what is it? Why are we worried about it? Do I need to worry about it? And what can we do about it? That's kind of what I'm here to talk about. I'm going to try, since I don't have slides to guide me, I'm going to try to keep it shorter than not. What we learned is that beginning very end of last year, so at the very tail end of December, China reported to the World Health Organization this cluster of this unusual respiratory severe pneumonias in this one area of China without a known cause. So that raised some red flags. They were able to identify very quickly that this is a new coronavirus, a novel coronavirus. And luckily for us, they were able to do some genetic sequencing and identify it very quickly so that we could do testing on it. But unfortunately, despite their best efforts, we are seeing community-wide spread out there in, um, out in China. 
And so what we're working on in, at the federal level, at the state level, and at local level is to try and prevent it from really making its way into the U.S. and from becoming widespread in the U.S. So going back to the basics, what, what's the coronavirus? So the coronavirus is actually not new to us. We see coronaviruses circulate every year. So that it's one of the very common, you know that common cold? That's one of the causes of the common cold, the normal coronaviruses. But every now and then, every couple of years, we see a new strain arise that causes particularly um, severe disease. Do you guys remember SARS? SARS was a coronavirus. That was a new, a novel coronavirus. Do you guys remember MERS, Middle East, respiratory, maybe five years, five, six years ago? That was another coronavirus. And so these new diseases, these, one, these new ones that come up, the reason we notice them is because A, they're new to the population and they cause particularly severe disease. So, all right, what do you mean by disease? Well, um, when you look at how um, they look, the disease they cause is an upper respiratory infection at first. So it may be, some get mild disease, something even as, even as mild as a bit of fever and a bit of cough. However, in some cases that fever and that cough can progress to pneumonia and or much more severe illness. So critical illness and even intubation and there have been some deaths. That's what we're looking to prevent. I will say that this, the, the current, well, this, we call it COVID ID. Um, the World Health Organization, um, COVID-19, sorry, renamed it from novel coronavirus 19 to COVID-19, so that's, what, that's how I'll refer to it from here on. The COVID-19 is, it's not as deadly as MERS. It's not as deadly as SARS. Um, it is probably a more severe disease than your average flu. However, it's probably about as transmissible as your average flu. So it's not like, you know, um, we worry a lot about diseases that are very, very infectious, where being in the same room at the same time with someone, even if you're across the room, can be, that's not like that. This is the kind of thing that, to our best knowledge, transmits the same way the flu does. So when you cough on someone or somebody, somebody coughs on their hand and you shake their hand and then you touch your eyes like that, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about something that's going to hang in the air for hours on end. That, and again, this is an evolving situation, and we, as we learn new things, we will update you all, but this is the best of our information. Um, and so knowing this, we know now that we have this new disease in China. It can cause severe disease. We don't, what does it mean for us in the U.S.? Right now, while we have community widespread in China, we do not have it here in the U.S. Right now, there are a total of, last check this morning, 15 individuals and, um, out across the U.S. and some, many of them, most of them, have had exposure directly from Wuhan or Hubei province in China. There are a few very close contacts, so individuals who took care of them when they were sick, individuals who lived in the same homes who are, who are some of those cases as well, but we're not seeing it out in the community. That's good. That's what we want to prevent. Um, and so what the U.S. is doing is there are, you've got to have heard, you, you, I'm sure you all have heard about this, there are a number of unprecedented things that we are doing in the U.S. to prevent widespread transmission. We are now preventing foreign, um, foreign nationals who've been in China from entering the U.S. U.S. citizens and permanent residents who've been there are allowed to come in, but we in public health are actually monitoring them for symptoms and referring them for testing should they become ill. All of this is to try and prevent it from becoming widespread. That being said, I would say that um, as we continue to do this, and as we continue to prepare for this, all of you, every single one of you, can participate in preventing transmission. So if for whatever reason it gets out there, there are things that each and every single one of you can do to prevent it from spreading. And these are the same things that we say it may seem tried and true, but it, it's tried and true for a reason. Those same things that really good hand hygiene, really good hand washing, before you eat, before you touch your face, after you touch your face, good cough hygiene. Don't cough into your hands. Cough into, do, the, um, do the coughing into the elbow, coughing into your shoulder. If you're using a Kleenex, dispose of it, wash your hands. All of those basic things are the same things we'll need to do, but it's actually just a reminder of how important it is to keep 
to keep a hold of those things, specifically because while we are doing everything that we can do, both in the state and in the federal level and at the local level to prevent infection, we need you to do your part as well. That's also honestly going to protect you from everything else, like the usual common cold, influenza, and all the other things that are going around too. So really, it's for the best. But, um, and I will, oh, one other thing that I forgot, because no more slides. There are currently no cases in Virginia. There are no active cases of coronavirus or COVID-19 in Virginia. I will not be surprised if and when we develop a case. There's just a lot of travel going on. We're a very global economy. That being said, the state is in the local, we are very prepared to respond. Your healthcare workers, your, your hospitals have all been talking about what are we gonna do? And some of them have already done that. What do we do if we have to test somebody? So they're all already thinking about that, which is a good thing. We want this. Folks here have been working about what are we gonna do if we have something? So there's a lot of preparation going on. So I want you all to be reassured about that if and when we do get a case. But don't forget, Every single one of you can be part of Fighting Soft. That's my question. I don't know if there are other questions, but that's my spiel. Well, I did want to mention one thing uh, real quick. We have the Deputy County Manager for Emergency Services, Tony McDowell, in the back of the room. And we have Carrie Tratina, who's for, from the manager's office. And we have our community officer, Scott Phillips. He's there, too, the police officer. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody knows who they are if you want to speak to them for, for whatever reason. One of the questions I have for you, Dr. Hooray, um, we've had several schools in our area in King William County and Prince Edward schools that closed because of the regular flu. I'll call it the regular flu. Um, how is that different from this? And um, is that the kind of thing that might happen? Right. So I think... Um if we, if, like I mentioned, how, at, at our current understanding, if this transmits very similar to seasonal influenza, there, if we should have community spread of coronavirus, we might end up asking for things like if you have coronavirus in your school, we might ask you to have folks stay home. And we may have uh, school administrative days. What are they called? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we may ask for that. We are not there. And even if we had one or two cases, we may not go there. This would happen if we have it throughout the community and we're trying to prevent it from going further into the community. So. One of the things they said that they were doing when they closed the schools was that they wiped down the chairs and they wiped down the buses, the seats in the bus. What are the, what's the type of thing that you might want to do if you think, well, if you got the regular flu even? So what type of thing, what chemicals could you use? What are the best ones? <laughs> I would say, I think what's very, it's most important more than, obviously the Environmental Protection Agency has a list of all of the disinfectants that hospitals should use when they're doing their cleaning. And certainly you can use those. There are, there are, there are many, there are many available. The most important things are routine disinfecting of your high touch surfaces. If you, um, whether or not you're using a one in 10 bleach you know, mix that you make at home, whether or not you find something at the store, usually what you wanna look for in your, in your labeling, on your, cause um, we're not allowed to say specific brands, I guess, but in the labeling, look at the labeling for, if you're looking for um, seasonal influenza, look for that. If you're looking, if you're worried, if we have community, community spread of coronavirus, look for FDA for emerging pathogens, not everybody is going to have that. You don't necessarily need that. CDC has said repeatedly routine cleaning is probably just fine. For those who wish to do the extra step, you can go for this emerging pathogens labeling. I would certainly say when you're doing your routine cleaning, look for things that are virucidal or kill viruses like influenza, kill viruses like human coronavirus. Because remember, coronavirus is out, the regular human coronavirus is out there every year doing the common cold thing. So those are the things that I would look for, your high touch surfaces, your knobs, your door handles, um, anything of those sorts, you're gonna wanna get, you're gonna wanna be pretty good about, just in general, keeping those clean. Are there any questions? Any questions? Right. Oh, oh uh, so the question was about hands, uh, hand pumps, hand which sand. I'm thinking is hand sanitizer? Yeah. So 
My personal recommendation in general is that hand washing, really good hand washing, is the best. 20 seconds with soapy water is the best. If you can't get for everything, I say that in general, period. And also for flu and coronavirus. If you can't get a hold of really good hand washing, you're away, you're kind of in the car, whatever, hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol content are the ones you're gonna to wanna to use. If, you, if you're, you know, you're in a pinch and you need to use something. Yeah, the ones out, you just have to look on the labeling. There are brands out there. Um, there, are, there are brands that are higher, but there are brands out there on the stores that are at least that high. Oh, go sorry. Back there and get, let me get you the microphone. That's okay. We've got two more speakers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's being done to develop the vaccine? Sure, vaccine? absolutely. There are, and I don't want to take everyone's time. And but if I repeat the question, it's about vaccines, future vaccines for this. There is active vaccine development in, um, in the works, both on the national and in the international stage. I think we are still pretty early in development. Um, I don't know that I've seen any reliable timelines on delivery for that, but I will say that there is more than one um, international and federal agency working on that. I did have a question that's related to that. Um, someone asked, uh, they said, I've gotten the flu shot every year for 25, 30 years. How come I'm not immune, you know, how, how can I still why, get the why flu? Why do I have to do it every year? Yeah. <laughs> why do I, why should I get it every question. year? Why do I need so to get it every year? The fun, so, not fun. The interesting thing about the influenza virus is that it likes to change. It likes to change itself a lot. Every, every year it changes itself a little bit, a little bit. Every now and then it pops and it changes itself a whole lot more. Um, what we do is we look at what's been going on. Usually what happens to us is um, preceded by what happened in the southern continent. So we look at what's been going on down there and we use that to predict what's going on up here. And that's how we develop what's going on in our flu vaccines. But you have to get it every year because to some, to some degree, every year it might be a little bit different. And so as things change, we need to give you the vaccine that's actually going to be against what we think is actually going to be in this year's flu strains. So if it's 20% effective, because I know sometimes they're, they're, right. they tell you that we know it's not as effective as it could be, right. you still want to you get absolutely it. Absolutely still it'll want to maybe get that. Do, it'll help, right. but it won't. So okay. exactly that. So even if, even in, in some years, the prediction isn't as good, and the match, the, they call it the match, the, um, isn't as good. Even in those years, even if it's 20% or even if it's 30%, you still want to get it because it may make, especially if you're older, if you have lung disease, if you have other medical conditions, because you want to, if it, it may um, make less severe, it may make it less severe, you may have a less severe course of disease, even if it doesn't prevent it entirely. Okay. Next, we're going to hear from Emily Ashley. <laughs> Uh, and as the emergency manager, I know you want to add some things that... Yeah, yeah thank you all for having me today. I just want to flip through this and give you all okay. just a little... Okay, uh, basically just to reaffirm that, um, to stay informed and how you'd be able to do that. Dr. Ruray gave us really great detailed information on the coronavirus and normal influenza, but also you all are a, a part of our community and we really wanna ensure that we have whole community preparedness. So any kind of information, disaster related or pandemic related, it all begins with you. You all are a really important component to keeping our community safe. So different ways that you can get involved. If there's any of you that have been part of our community emergency response team or CERT team members, this is a great program for you to be a part of. It's free. We have a class coming up in March. And so you can come, and it's just general preparedness of how you can learn more about how the health department prepares, how to make your own family disaster plan, how to put out a, a small fire, some things that would be really great just for your own household safety. And then you could also be able to check on your neighbors after you learn the class as well. So it's a great outreach tool for you all to be more prepared. And also, Henrico Alert, our Code Red program. 
what Henrico Alert does is this is a tool that allows you all to get emergency information during a disaster. So we don't use this system to let you know about a town hall meeting or to let you know that about a water main break, but this is something if there's critical life-saving information to be had, we would push out a message that would give you information on what to do to keep your home safe. So we encourage everyone to go uh, to Henrico Alert and you can download Code Red and you can download the app on your phone or if you just have a landline, you can put that in there too. And if you have a loved one that you know may have difficulty getting information or doesn't have a cell phone, you can enroll their information into that system and even have the number come to you to be able to get the alert and you'd be able to drive over and check on them. And also, uh, as Dr. Rory mentioned, uh, VDH, Virginia Department of Health, they have a really robust website that has the most up-to-date information about the coronavirus, about influenza. They update this information regularly, every 48 hours at a minimum, that they put new information out. So that's a great way to be able to stay up-to-date. There's the information specifically for the health department. And also social media is a great way to stay engaged and be able to get information from the county resources. And we also have that information on our regular website. And if we didn't have internet resources or you don't have social media during a disaster, our libraries will have printouts of all the most critical information that you need to have. So you'd just be able to go to the local library here in your neighborhood. Any questions geared towards emergency management? Yes, ma'am. those who cannot speak, read, write, those kinds of um, contacts and making sure that the word gets out for those individuals to register so they know that they, people can reach them. Okay. The, they're not going to be able to process some of this information that we're talking about. Okay. So the question was, how do we make sure that we're inclusive in our planning efforts of people who have all kinds of disabilities, young and old, how do we make sure that we're planning from them? If we know that they, they can't be here and get the information. So what we really try to do is outreach to the caretakers, making sure that uh, we work with the health department and we work with um, our special needs coordinator with the Central Virginia Health Care Coalition, and we're making sure that we are giving them the same information that they can go to people who may have some different needs and abilities to make sure that they're prepared as well. Yes, ma'am. I wish you could answer this. How about schools and um, nursing homes, retirement centers? Are they prepared to send somebody out if they have them? I'll touch on this, and then uh, Dr. Varey, if she wants to add to it, she can. So um, schools and nursing homes, they all report their illnesses, especially if it's tracked communicable diseases, they are tracking all of that through the health department. So the nursing home has to have a plan of how they would quarantine people or keep people, maybe not everyone comes to a feeding hall at the same time. They all have these plans in place that are in their normal procedures that they're able to somewhat prevent the spread. And I know, um, that schools also push out information for children not to come to school sick. Make sure that you're keeping them home, the hand washing messages going out. So a lot of just general everyday communication, they're pushing that information out. But on the back end, behind the scenes, they're also reporting numbers to the Department of Health. It is, uh, we have actually been in pretty the, we have a really good relationship with the Nairaco County Public Schools, and their 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 head their head of nursing is actually uh, very closely allied are tied to our epidemiol our disease tracking person, and so they're uh, when they have questions they reach out to us. They reached out to us around COVID nineteen. Our nursing homes and acute living or our uh, long term care facilities are all also connected with our with us as well around this. So, to some degree, like you mentioned. There, this is not too dissimilar in some ways from influenza or other things. So a lot of the infection prevention that they're going to be doing already and all of the reporting they're already doing will help in this situation. Yeah, that's a question yeah, that we have. So, 
so there are two. <laughs> there are two um, two questions. So if the question, first question is, how do we know that providers are going to report this? Number two is, well, really that's the big. How are providers kept aware of what's going on? On to the second one first. We have been doing CDC has been doing outreach to across the board, providers, they've been doing health alerts, they've been doing webinars, they've been doing webcasts. Our commissioner of health has also sent out notif letters and information around COVID-19 to all licensed MDs. Um, and to some degree, I believe we've also, went where we have connections within our hospital systems, with our, our, with our healthcare systems and other practices, the healthcare systems are also sh sharing it with their providers as well. Now, when it comes to how do you know it's not there? Um, <laughs> That's a very good question. There are two things that reassure me right now. And the first is that right, um, we are looking at the highest risk individuals, those folks who came from China most recently. We're actually tracking them when they come in because they're coming in on flights. We're, we're tracking them and we're monitoring for symptoms. Down the road, um, CDC is looking potentially, if we start seeing more in the community, they may start doing more community level test or more routine testing alongside, you know, when they test for flu and other respiratory viruses. But right now we're focusing on those who we are thinking are most likely to actually have it. That's, oh, hmm? The veterans, I heard the feds, sorry. <laughs> we are, the, what do you mean by? They do, but everybody has to fly in through Customs and Border Patrol. And so ever, since everybody comes in through Customs and Border Control, everybody, veteran or otherwise, has to be tracked in that same way. So if that, those vets have been to China in the last 14 days, they would still show up on one of our rosters because it's, I'm not sure that there's anyone who is special or exempt from that monitoring. Dr. Ray, one more question that's related to that. What are the, the symptoms? Mm -hmm. When, when would you know you're sick enough to go to the doctor mm -hmm. or even to an emergency room? I would say this even not for COVID-19, because remember, COVID-19 is not in the, out in the community. Um, we think of COVID-19 in somebody for COVID-19, as I mentioned, can be a very mild respiratory illness, a little bit of a cough, a little bit of a fever, and then you get better. Or it can be severe with pneumonia and, and more severe illness. We're not seeing that in the community. But even if you're out, but flu is still out there, flu still kills people every year. If you're at home and if you develop fevers, you develop chills, you know, keep an eye on yourself, see how you're doing. You start having trouble breathing, you can't take care of yourself, you need to reach out for help. If you have, for whatever reason, recently traveled to certain areas of China or taken care of somebody with confirmed COVID-19, you should already be in touch with us, and if you're not, they need to be. Um, if for whatever reason they've fallen through the cracks, and they shouldn't have, but if they have, they need to reach out. But if you haven't, you're more likely, you are very likely to have influenza or a similar illness. You still need to, if you aren't breathing well, if you have a lot of other medical conditions that might make you more prone to be more sick, you need to let someone know. And that, that leads us to Sarah Morris, I think, very well. Yeah. Um, Ms. Morris, as I mentioned, is, is the advocate for the aging. And there's some programs out there that if you or someone you know perhaps is elderly and they're aging in place and they live by themselves, what kind of help can, can you get from Henrico? So you, you've yeah. got a lot of things you can cover, though. What do you want to talk about first? So. Yeah, so I think I'll just talk a little bit about some of the different programs that exist within the community um, that a lot of our nonprofits um, have for individuals who are older and maybe living alone. Um, for example, Feed More Meals on Wheels, that's a really great program, um, especially if we have an illness or an injury. Our nutrition can be one of the first things that can be kind of take a hit. Um, so it's important that we continue getting proper nutrition because especially when we're sick we need to make sure that we're keeping our nutrition up so that we can still be able to fight off whatever that illness is. Um, so Meals on Wheels can deliver a hot lunchtime meal to those who are homebound um, and maybe not otherwise able to fix a really nutritious meal. Um, it also provides kind of peace of mind for 
your loved ones, knowing that someone is being checked on um, once a day um, throughout the week. Uh, so feed more Meals on Wheels. Um, I do have a um, handout that has that information, has their phone number on it, as well as Senior Connections phone number. They do provide sponsorships um, for that through the Older Americans funding. Um, so it can be completely free to your loved one or someone that you know. Um, it's not based on income. Um, so that's a really great resource as well. There's also programs, um, Friendly Visitor or um, Telephone Reassurance um, programs as well, where you can have somebody call your loved one either once a day or a couple times a week, depending on the program. Um, but it gives a, a good peace of mind if you have someone who's living alone or um, maybe they have a family member who's living with them who isn't at home as often. Um, these are really great programs to know about. Um, Jewish Family Services has one, um, Commonwealth Catholic Charities, and then Senior Connections does as well. Um, so it can be a great peace of mind knowing that there is somebody who's checking on your loved one. Um, there's also programs as well that I wanted to let people know about is um, if your loved one is not able to get out to the doctor or it's really difficult for them to get out to, to see their doctor, um, having a visiting physician, there are a few different programs throughout the, um, the region um, through the Visiting Physicians Association, Bon Secours Senior Services, and then VCU's Center for Advanced Health Management. Again, all of their information is on that handout. Um, but they can come see your loved one in their home. So if there's somebody who has a compromised immune system or, um, you know, as we age, especially if we have other illnesses going on, it can be more difficult to fight off those illnesses. So it might be better to have a doctor come to your home rather than exposing yourself to some of the other illnesses that may be floating around. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure that people are aware of too is that um, if you are admitted to the hospital and you have a three-day qualifying stay, you've been admitted for three days, that you can take um, advantage of the um, therapy that comes along with that, um, either through skilled nursing care or having therapy in your home um, for up to 21 days, depending on your Medicare. Um, but that's kind of a Medicare across the board. We'll cover that. Um, but looking at your individual plan to see if, um, you can take advantage of that because, again, as we age, it can be more difficult to fight off those um, illnesses and can make us weaker. So it's important that we um, maintain that, um, that we use those benefits as well. Um, and then just lastly, we touched a little bit on this with the congregate living situations. Um, if you are ill or you know that you're fighting off something, even especially as we're going into the spring, if you think it's just allergies, just stay on the safe side and stay at home. Um, if you do go to see someone, even if you're not ill, make sure you wash your hands when you, when you first enter um, because especially in a congregate living situation like a nursing facility or an assisted living, things spread really rapidly. So it's incredibly important to make sure that, um, that we do everything we can to keep everybody safe in those, because that's, that's those people's homes. So we need to make sure that we respect their homes as well. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. This yes. is a general question yeah. about um, does Ms. Morris help people to search for continuing care facilities? Okay. Yeah, so um, I can, I'm pretty much here to help with all sorts of things aging related. Um, so any questions that people have or any um, navigation that they're looking for, I can absolutely help. Yep. I do have a, uh, two more questions. I think we touched on one, and these came in earlier. Uh, should I buy a mask? Face mask. I would love to answer this question. Okay. <laughs> I, um, a lot of folks ask, and I've been asked this many, many times, so when it's flu season or with this coronavirus or this COVID-19, do I need to buy a mask and wear a mask in public if I'm not sick? No, don't do it. You don't need to do it. If you are, um, if you're sick and you're going in to see your doctor, you may want to be wearing a mask so you don't spread it to other people. 
However, what, pe what we find is that mask wearing, when people don't do it right, you end up touching your face more, which actually defeats the purpose. It also gives people a very false sense of security. They think, I'm wearing a mask. Oh, I'm fine. No, because you've actually still touched things, and then when you touch your face or you eat things and you introduce it, you can still get sick. You, CDC, VDH, WHO, everyone is saying in the community, if you're not sick, don't need to mask. If you are caring for someone in your home who has, say, influenza, I suppose they're in, con in conjunction with everything else, hand washing, very good hygiene, and all of those things, you may want to consider it. If, you, if you're sick, you may want to consider it when you're going out in public. But if you're well, just to protect yourself, wash your hands, good cough hygiene, don't wear a mask. <laughs> And the last question, which some people think is the most important, is the coronavirus related to Corona beer? <laughs> they have got. And yes, I got it, and they weren't they weren't laughing. <laughs> they, I know it's not funny, but it is kind of. It is. Um, so coronaviruses, they have Corona beer has got to be so sad about this episode. <laughs> but the reason. <laughs> I mean, the reason that coronaviruses are called that is the same reason that corona beer is called corona is because coronaviruses have a bit of a crown shape to them. So we named them coronaviruses a, a long time ago because of the way that the, sh the actual shape of the virus on, on electron microscopy. And it just so happens that it shares a name with corona beer, which is also referring to crown for corona beer. You see the crown on the front? So not quite related, but that's why it's called coronavirus. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well. Okay. okay. How are we communicating with the faith community? Many of them have nurses that work with the, the faith community. So maybe our emergency services yeah. person? So Ms. Ashley. Yeah, uh, emergency management. So anybody that has any kind of health care providers, they're covered. And so emergency management, um, well, it's part of our public outreach, uh, part of our whole community preparedness, is also our faith-based communities and making sure that they're getting out information, um, not only for just general disasters and information, but also at what point do we switch from when of shaking people's hands versus not shaking people's hands or you know, sharing communion. And so we try to push out information as well. And again, it's not specific information, it's just the same general hygiene information that the Virginia Department of Health posts. So we are just trying to share all of our information as much as possible through as many platforms as possible. So that's that piece that you have out there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Yes, and we also work through, we have the Virginia Organizations Active in Disasters, all of our VOAG groups, which is a lot of faith-based communities, and so we also try to share all of this information with them. So again, that whole community preparedness is really key. So it doesn't matter how people are getting the information, we just want to make sure that they're getting it, and it can be through multiple avenues. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I know the county manager was here a little while ago. Um, and uh, we are running a little early, but that's okay. I believe this is going to be, it is video, it is, wasn't totally video stream live, but you did record it, yes? So it will be available online. It is archived. If you go to YouTube and go to Henrico County Government, Tuckahoe Town Meeting, you will be able to pull it up and show it to another group or, uh, you know, present it with this information. Um, there were uh, about 10 different people, 10 other people who were watching us online once, once it was up and going. Uh, this evening at 6.30 will be another presentation, but this will be only online. So if you have anyone that might want to ask questions and they didn't hear the answer or you think they didn't answer it, the, you know, you have something else you want to ask, go ahead and, and go to YouTube and, and check in or again, use my email address and you can send it to me at 3 o'clock this afternoon. I'll I'll keep it handy. 
uh, and you can ask more questions if you have any for the 6.30 presentation. That also will be videotaped and it will, um, it will be archived and available online for the future. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, um, what is it? Cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. If you don't, you'll spread disease. Thank you very much. That was my kindergarten teacher. Thank you.